Hello, everybody, and welcome back. Um, we are very, very lucky to have Peter with us uh, here tonight. Um, Peter, I'm used to seeing you in much, much happier circumstances in Oxford at the Skoll World Forum and here at the Conduit as a member. So um, I'm grateful that you are speaking, but I'm sad to be seeing you under these circumstances. Great to be here all the same, Paul. Um, so I want to ask a couple of kind of, I want to do a global COVID tour and see what that may um, inform us about in the context of what's happening in the UK and London. Um, so today was a pretty significant piece of what one could think of as good news coming out of China. No net internal um, uh, infections. And that seems to be pretty remarkable in a 1.4 billion person country. So tell us about that and what, what lesson we should take from it. Sure. Thanks, Paul. So, so first off, of course, you all know that China is where this pandemic started, right? In the city of Wuhan in uh, December, where it seemed to jump over from, from animals to humans um, and, and, and really raged out of control for a number of weeks and really into early February um, until the point where the, the government in China instituted really unprecedented interventions to control the spread, which included putting um, effectively 100 million people in, in, in quarantine and lockdown, um, in addition to a number of other measures, like building 14 hospitals over the course of a month to increase the, the system's capacity. Um, and what we saw was that after rising exponentially that we started to see a plateau uh, towards the end of February. And, and ever since then, the number of new cases in China has been decreasing until um, uh, the last 24 hours, where as you say, Paul, there have been zero new locally transmitted cases, meaning the only, the only new cases in the last couple of days have been in people who flew into China from somewhere else, actually imported cases. And this is really important news because it should give us all hope that it's possible. China was not starting from a place where there were just a few infections. China has had over 80,000 infections. Um, and so yes, the measures taken were extraordinary. And once upon a time in February, a lot of us said, well, it's an authoritarian country. They can do lockdowns there. We could never do that in a free society in a place like London. And lo and behold, a few weeks ago, Italy, um, unfortunately, was forced into having to, to adopt similar measures. But I think for, the take, for me, the big takeaway is that it is possible to contain this pandemic. It just takes significant and concerted action. And, and in terms of the containment efforts, so, you know, um, centered around a, a kind of particular geography within a much bigger country, in some ways, you could think of that as a way of thinking about highly concentrated cities in places like the UK in the context of a much bigger country. Um, is there, have China genu you know, genuinely beaten it, not just in Wuhan, but elsewhere? Or are there reasons to fear or suspect that having beaten it in Wuhan, they might take their eye off the ball and it might spread into other parts of China? China has not beaten it and nobody has beaten it. Um, there are a number of countries in Asia that you could call success stories because to varying degrees, they have brought the, um, the epidemic under control in their settings. Apart from China, we're talking about South Korea, Taiwan, Japan to an extent, Singapore, and then Macau and, and Hong Kong, which of course not countries, but, but other settings. All of them have done that through some combination of um, aggressive, widespread testing and contact tracing and isolation, and then social distancing measures, quite substantial but targeted. In South Korea, they were able to use widespread testing to know where were the hot spots of infection, where were the clusters of infections, and then target their social distancing efforts there. So they never had to do the nationwide lockdown on the scale that China did because they got their early. Um, so there's, there's a lot, you know, China bought us time and these other countries have shown us what works. Unfortunately, we haven't heeded that advice. Now to come back to your earlier point, in all the places that have this under control, if you want to call that at the moment, doesn't mean they've beaten it. 
the, the virus is still there. And theoretically, the moment life got back to normal and everyone starts getting on the train in the morning and interacting with one another and being in close proximity, um, there's a risk of a second surge or a second spike in infections. So what China's been doing over the last several weeks is trying very slowly to start to get back to normal, to start to get back to work, to begin to open things up in a very careful, gradual way while monitoring for, for new infections. Um, other places are struggling with the same thing. We have occasionally seen some small spikes in places like South Korea. Um, nobody quite knows how we're going to do that, and it may take months and months and months to figure it out. We may not get back to normal in those places until there's a vaccine. Um, but if I had to choose between you know, these two problems, um, one is being overwhelmed like Italy is right now and having to decide who lives and who dies, or two, we've contained this, how do we start to get back to normal safely? Of course, I would choose the second option. So let's talk about Italy then, because Italy still report, is still reporting on a daily basis a staggering number of deaths and scenes from Italian hospitals are reminiscent of war zones, not what you would think in highly prosperous parts of northern Italy. Um, tell us how uh, are the net number of deaths and infections declining in Italy? Has the lockdown or is the lockdown beginning to show signs of working? Uh, and what lessons we can learn from the Italian experience? Yeah, so this is the other path, right? This is the, this is the other direction that things can go. I talked about some of the success stories like South Korea, um, which were all premised on early aggressive action. Delayed action, complacency, thinking it's not gonna happen here is what gets you unfortunately to where Italy has been over the last several weeks. And it's worth remembering how quickly that happened, right? This is an epidemic that doubles every three to five days. And so if you just do the math, you go from tens to hundreds to thousands to tens of thousands of cases quite quickly. And so what feels normal today um, is a catastrophe in two weeks time. That's what's happened in Italy. And they realized too late uh, and put first the, the north of the country and then essentially the entire country on lockdown after this had already reached sort of escape velocity. That was about two weeks ago. At this time, maybe over the last couple of days, there's been some plateauing in the numbers of new infections, but yesterday there were over 450 deaths reported in one single day. Um, so even after two weeks of lockdown, it's not clear to me that they've started to sort of contain the spread that we're still seeing, um, we're still seeing new infections. And of course, there's gonna be some latency, right? A death today is really gonna reflect someone who was infected, uh, you know, maybe two weeks earlier. And so there's gonna be some time before we see these changes, um, but they're absolutely overwhelmed. I'm sure many of you here have seen some of the, the, the really um, tragic news reports about what's happening. We call this disaster medicine or catastrophe medicine, where they've had to develop protocols um, to when you got two patients in front of you to decide which of those two patients is more likely to survive if they get the ventilator, because there aren't two ventilators for those two patients. And usually that's the younger, healthier patient. Um, and so doctors and nurses are literally having to decide who lives and who dies. Um, and, and I've been in those situations, unfortunately, over my career in a, in a, in a couple of different settings, and those decisions you know, haunt me even still and wouldn't wish that on anybody. And um, uh, it, it's tragic, tragic what, the, what they're going through. And I can just only hope that we're not gonna see that you know, here in the UK and other settings soon. And I will just say as an aside, the settings in which you've had to make those decisions have been in poor developing countries with uh, you know, Ebola outbreaks or you know, something of the kind of that, you would never have thought that this would be playing itself out in Milan. Um, so it's, a, it's just unprecedented. Um, so let's pivot to discuss the US for a while and then we'll come back and, and use the rest of our time to talk about the UK. Um, in the spectrum of good news being China has it potentially under control to bad news, um, the US is on the other side, uh, uh, at least in this respect, and that is reports coming out of the US that um, much higher numbers of uh, mortality rates amongst people um, 50 and under, uh, which seems to be kind of anomalous uh, in terms of the data. So tell us a little bit about how you understand that and how alarming that should be uh, in terms of both spread and targeting of the virus. 
Yeah, so, so first, I think it's worth understanding um, what we see with this infection in general, that we estimate uh, it's now around 1.5% fatality rate, meaning 1.5% of people infected die, um, that there's a big sort of confidence interval window. It might be as little as a half a percent. In some places, it's, it's three, four percent, even a bit higher in Italy. The majority of those deaths have been in folks over 60 years of age, um, and even more so over 70, um, and then folks with chronic medical conditions that can, that can weaken their immune system. We've seen infections across the age spectrum, including children and even newborns. Um, young, young ones have tended to be um, less severe. Um, overall, about 20% of people who get this get severe, um, uh, severe disease, meaning severe enough that they need to be hospitalized, and 5 to 10% require ICUs. That's a lot of people, by the way. But 80% go are anywhere from a mild flu to kind of a walking pneumonia that really knocks you out for, for, for a week or two. Um, there was sort of this belief that young people are relatively spared, and there have been a couple of things that have that have poked um, holes in that in that um, idea. We've seen also a very high number of infections um, in, in younger demographics in South Korea, and in. Um, in, in Europe, what we've seen is that about 15% of health workers who have become infected have ended up in ICUs. And most of the health workers are in kind of the 30 to 50 range, give or take, generally young and healthy. So it's surprising to see such a high degree of, of, of people getting that sick. And of course, especially with health workers, that's, that's alarming. Now in the US, these new reports that a high proportion of the hospitalized patients are in their 20s, um, could mean one of two things. Maybe there's a surprise and for some reason we don't yet understand, young people actually are more susceptible to severe disease. The other, and I think far more likely, is that there are a heck of a lot of 20 year olds, 20 somethings, who are infected with COVID-19 that we don't know about. That actually if we, if we had an accurate count of all the cases, right, say there's 10,000 cases reported, because the testing has been um, so limited in the U.S. and because we know there's been silent community spread for now eight weeks there, we would guesstimate that for every reported infection, there are 10 more out there that are not counted. So we probably have hundreds of thousands of infections in the U.S. right now that we don't know about. It may simply be that a lot of those are among 20-somethings who have been the last ones to kind of heed the warnings about social distancing and staying home, the ones most likely to say, oh yeah, but it won't affect me. I'm still going to get on with it. I'm going to go to my yoga class. I'm going to go to the pub, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, um, so that's my guess, um, that actually it's a canary in a coal mine. Not that young people are so vulnerable, but that this whole thing is so much worse in the U.S. than we even know at the moment. And I, I think that, that reckoning will, will come soon. Sobering. Um, okay, so let's turn to the U.K. Um, I'm speaking to you from the conduit in London. You're in Oxford. Uh, it looks as though London, if all reports are to be to be believed will go into a lockdown sometime tomorrow um, and that portions of the country could conceivably follow if the um, prevalence of the virus is as uh, high in those parts as it is in London. Um, so is London going to be more like Milan or more like Singapore? We've already missed our chance to be Singapore. Singapore is where they are because they acted immediately. I mentioned before that China bought us time when they took this unprecedented step of putting 100 million people in quarantine um, and essentially shutting down their entire economy. That bought the rest of the world six or eight weeks. Singapore responded immediately. They remembered SARS. Um, and acted um, and put travel restrictions in place and were all over every single case and were tracing every contact of every case and isolating aggressively. We were sleepwalking here in the UK, they were sleepwalking in the US um, and we, we, wasted, we wasted that time. Um, 
guy called Neil Ferguson from Imperial College, um, you may have read about this, one of the, one of the top advisors to the government um, in, in terms of sort of disease modeling and authored that uh, really important paper earlier in the week, which was credited with shifting the government's um, really catastrophic previous strategy to, to what we're heading towards now. He is in isolation with presumed COVID-19 infection um, himself, having spent a lot of time at Westminster and 10 Downing Street recently. And when he was interviewed about this, he said, well, it's not surprising at all. We know there are tens of thousands of cases in central London right now. We, don't, we haven't counted them, but we know they exist. Um, so unfortunately, again, we've already sort of seen that silence spread for a period of time. Um, we've gone way beyond the Singapore window. So I'd say, we're, we're either where Italy was three weeks ago, or maybe we have a little bit more buffer and wiggle room if we act and act quickly um, to stop things from getting that bad. I don't know for sure. Um, the hospitals are already filling up, talking to colleagues at hospitals in London and elsewhere. They're already filling up, ICUs are already filling up. Um, and, uh, and I think we're gonna really see a significant quickening uh, of this over the next couple of days. So it's unfortunate that we have to do the lockdown, but we do, and it probably should have happened sooner. Um, if any of you listening are still out and about, um, it's time to stop. And remember, it's not just about you, it's about everybody else, right? The more physical distance we each, push, we each put between one another, um, the, um, uh, the, the more we're gonna be able to break chains of transmissions and slow things down. So every time I go out for one last trip to the shops or, um, you know, one last uh, workout at the gym, um, it's not about me. It's about, you know, my grandmother, my neighbor and others that, you know, my actions are putting at risk. So maybe this won't be an option after tomorrow anyways, but it's time for us all to kind of, uh, you know, shut in, take care of one another and, and hope for the best. So... <clears throat> What's alarming about the kind of hospital um, uh, anecdotes that you're, you're reporting to us is um, it seems though Italy has almost twice the number of hospital beds per capita than the UK yeah. and it's struggling. So in some ways, if you, you know, if the UK manages to have only half the number of critical care patients as Italy, um, it will be as bad as the scenes we're seeing in Italy. If it has as many, it will be double as bad just by, by, by kind of just applying that math. Um, so we either have to just brace ourselves for the very real prospects of kind of the triage that you've been describing happening in, in hospitals across the UK, um, or we have to think about, you know, what things we can do now in the couple of weeks we have ahead before London becomes like Milan mm -hmm. uh, or other parts of Northern Italy. And so I have two questions in that regard. The one is, um, what can we do, if anything, to try and transfer some of the care of the critically ill or severely ill at, to homes? Because if there are no hospital beds, that's our only choice. Uh, and two, is there any... Um, cause for hope in terms of getting more ventilators. I mean, I just started geeking out and there seems as though if you just go online, there are a hundred different initiatives to try and reverse engineer and hack and design in ventilators to help people in, in a home setting or elsewhere. But those two things, what advice can you give? Uh, home care and, and just the, the, the more quirky points around ventilators. Yeah, I imagine everyone um, with us today has heard about this notion of flattening the curve, right? That you sort of take a potential spike in infections and then try to flatten it and lengthen it out. And the, the idea there is that you prevent everybody from getting sick at the same time because you have so many people that it overwhelms your, your finite and limited capacity in the health system to care for those patients and especially those 20% who are gonna be sick enough to need hospitalization. Um, again, we've lost a lot of um, time, but there's still an opportunity to do that. And that's why um, the lockdown and all this kind of social distancing stuff still matters a lot um, because it can still blunt that spike and buy us a little bit more time by the health system a little bit more time, et cetera. Um, so we already know that we've We've kind of abandoned the idea of testing people and, and told them not even to call 111 if you think you have coronavirus and you're, you're not sick enough to need oxygen. Um, and so most people are going to be um, 
you know, going it alone at home anyways, um, uh, and, and sort of that is, that is what it is. Um, the reality is that 20% give or take are going to require hospitalization. Um, it's really difficult because you essentially have to set up a parallel health system, right, for infection control purposes. So you have to be able to have, you know, sort of wards, waiting rooms, parts of the hospital that are only for coronavirus patients and then still be able to have bits of the hospital for everybody else who still needs services and staff working in one or the other. Um, and so there's a lot of work going now to repurpose um, operating theaters into temporary intensive care units and things um, and, and things like that. Um, all of that stuff is really important. Um, uh, we're gonna face a surge soon um, and, and no one knows exactly how it's gonna go or how difficult it's gonna be. Um, you know, there. I think there is, I don't know if there is anymore a possibility of setting up temporary hospital facilities that might be able to manage the folks who don't need intensive care but still require some significant medical care and that might be able to be done in old army barracks and even hotels and other kinds of things like that. Um, I don't know exactly how much um, of that exists right now. There was talk some weeks ago about using facilities like that for just kind of quarantine facilities, um, but I haven't seen that as part of the plan. Now, lastly, your, um, your mention of hacking ventilators, of going on kind of a wartime footing and having, you know, sort of Rolls-Royce and Land Rover start to manufacture ventilators that's great, we need that stuff. We need people to ramp up production of protective equipment, ventilators, et cetera. The thing to remember is ventilators are not plug and play. They're very difficult technologies to use, right? I spent 15 years doing my medical training. I have a hard time ventilating a patient on my own, right? This is a very specialized set of skills and you need operators, right? So to me, actually, our bottleneck, our limiting factor in the health system here might not even be the number of ventilators, it might be what's gonna to happen to our health workers. And something that I want everyone to know and actually be shouting from the rooftops about is, we got people on the front lines, doctors, nurses, other care workers who are working 12, 16 hour shifts already to take care for folks who are sick. The, the so-called PPE, the personal protective equipment that a lot of them are receiving, is not fit for purpose. Um, in Rwanda, where I worked for a long time, health workers have better PPE than GPs are being given in the NHS right now. You know, those flimsy little surgical masks with the little ties on the back that we've been telling you on the news for two months don't work, so please don't use them. That's what GPs are getting. They're not getting the respirators that can actually prevent them from getting infected. So imagine what happens when a few weeks from now, or if I should say, um, 20, 30, 40% of the health workforce are down because they themselves were infected. In addition to kind of the moral hazard of allowing that to happen, there's gonna be nobody to run the ventilators. And so I'm actually more worried about what are we doing for health workers? We need to be getting them real PPE um, and we need to make sure they have access to testing. You know, some people are gonna get sick and not have coronavirus. They're just gonna have a flu or a cold and maybe after a few days they could get back to work. If we can't even test that doctor, she's gonna have to stay in isolation for 14 days and not get back to work. So it's stupid. And I'm sorry to say that, but I don't understand um, many of the decisions that are being made. But, um, but I think that one of the most important things we can do right now is fight for health workers to get the protection they need, not just because it's the right thing to do, but they're our, not our first line of defense, they're our last line of defense. So Peter, um, we are we're straying into Q&A time, so I'm gonna go directly in to ask some questions from people who have tuned into the webinar. Mm -hmm. um, so will COVID-19 cause the same amount of stress on the NHS or economic disruption next year? Is this going to be an annual shutdown until a vaccine is found? Great question. The answer is we don't know. One of the big questions is what kind of immunity does a person get after being infected um, and then recovering? Um, and we don't know. Um, there's a lot of talk about this herd immunity concept that the government was pushing until um, a couple of days ago. Um, if you look at SARS, which is a cousin of this coronavirus, your immunity is pretty good and pretty long lasting. 
most of the other viruses in the coronavirus family give you immunity that only lasts for a couple of months. It's relatively fleeting. For this one, we have no idea. So it might be that if I'm infected and recover that I never get this again. It might be that I'm protected somewhat for a couple of years. Um, we just don't know. And um, so I, I think it's pretty clear that it's unlikely this virus is gonna go away on its own. Um, uh, hopefully this idea of reaching herd immunity will help. Um, but the only way to safely get, safely get to herd immunity is through a vaccine. And uh, as many of you have heard, even in Guinness Book of World Records time, 12 to 18 months away, and that's an uncertain proposition. So this is gonna be something that I think is gonna be with us in a significant way and be a significant disruption to the way we live um, and to our economic systems, not for weeks, but for months and possibly longer. Can you, what is your source for reliable COVID-19 information? Are there uh... A website or places that people can go who want to sort of get a global view and then a UK view. What do you? Uh, where do you go? Yeah, it's a, a number of different sources. I think that for um, for just like the global data and the numbers, the Johns Hopkins University has a terrific coronavirus resource center. There's kind of an interactive map um, where you can look at the number of cases, um, uh, the number of deaths, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. A lot of the major journalistic outputs have actually been doing really good reporting on this. So the New York Times, um, uh, the Washington Post, the Atlantic, the Guardian, I think have all been doing good responsible reporting on this. Um, the BBC um, sort of largely, I think some outlets in the UK were a little bit hesitant to question some of the things that um, were being done here um, and sort of needed a lot of folks in the public health community to really speak up and sound the alarm before they would start to report on that. Um, but for the most part, I think that, um, that the coverage is been good. Um, honestly, what, what's interesting is that a lot of the information um, to come out through the scientific literature takes time, even when you remove a lot of these obstacles. So I've actually found social media to be extremely useful as a tool for getting good information from scientists, um, from the public health community, from epidemiologists who are modeling things, um, from folks who are working on the political response, et cetera. The problem is that social media is a cesspool, right? And so for every one source of accurate information, um, there are a hundred others that are peddling conspiracy theories and, 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 and quack remedies and things like that. Um, so so there's, there's some news outlets I would suggest in the Johns Hopkins. Um, I posted a couple of days ago a list of Twitter follows on, on my own Twitter account that I really recommend um, folks, and I could repost that today or we could share it um, if that's useful but um, there's not a single place but actually the kind of up to the minute information and the people I trust the most are speaking out about this you know sort of every hour and I've learned a lot that way. Amazing. Um, I have a question about Russia. Um, mm -hmm. it seems at least from the data that's available that Russia seems to have very few, few cases. Now could it possibly be that this is a scientific anomaly or there's some unusual immunity amongst Russians or is this much more likely to be attributable to low levels of testing and, uh, and not very transparent communication? My best guess is that we're not getting accurate reports about the number of cases. Um, I don't know whether they're doing a lot of testing or not. What I do know is that at least in some parts of Russia, there is some enforced quarantine, right? So there is some kind of lockdown type activity because you've seen reports of, um, of the authorities cracking down on folks who aren't following directives. Now they wouldn't be in that setting unless there was a significant sort of outbreak in that situation. So I don't believe the numbers that we're seeing. Um, there's no reason to believe that there's a, um, there's a weather related reason or a biological reason why that particular part of the world would be spared. Um, so my guess is they're just not releasing those figures. We saw the same thing in Iran um, a couple of weeks ago, which was the first part of the Middle East to really um, face the burden with this. And, um, and at least initially, um, the numbers of reported cases was relatively low and the death rate looked really high. Um, and that was because I think they were underreporting the total number of cases. And it was only when a bunch of government ministers got sick and things like that. Um, and there were satellite reports of, uh, of mass graves being dug for casualties of the, of the epidemic that we really saw that. I'm not saying that's what's happening in Russia, but my guess is we're just not getting transparent information. Question, uh, another question um, from one of the people who's tuned in is, um, if you have only mild symptoms, like no fever, feels more like a cold, and in a pre-COVID-19 world, you would just go, I've got a cold, and you may even come to work. But 
what what should you be doing in terms of self isolation um, you know and secondly even if you're healthy do i glean from the kind of posture you're taking right now that people should be self isolating and social distancing like like crazy right now even if you're just in great health yeah the most important thing any one of us can do is to stay away from other people as much as possible that's just what it comes down to and so if you just think about that in every kind of decision and interaction um, i think it'll help a lot and again it's not about you it's about the greater good it's about your grandma it's about your neighbor etc um, so that's the case right now for um for everybody um, one of the challenges in the UK is that because we're not doing a lot of testing outside of the hospital, most of us who get sick won't necessarily ever know if we had COVID-19 or not. What I can tell you is that the symptoms of that particular disease, they're a lot like flu. It's fever, it's dry cough, it's feeling wiped out and just wanting to get horizontal and stay there. It is not runny nose, stuffy nose, sneezing, sinus pain, sore throat. Those are symptoms of kind of upper, upper respiratory infections and kind of more routine colds. So for what it's worth, if you have those things, it's probably not COVID-19. I can't tell you that for sure. Um, the guidance here is we're not gonna test everybody and tell you whether you've got it or not. So everybody who's got a fever or prolonged cough should be self-isolating for 14 days. So behave as if you got it and do your best to stay away from everybody. Um, staying home is one thing, being able to isolate yourself from other members of your household is another thing, but I suppose you do the best you can. Final question, Peter, and then we're, we're out of time. Um, schools are all are either closed already or about to close. If you're a family with children, children can be asymptomatic or get a very mild version of it. And if you've got more than one child, can they pass it to each other in a chain way which goes beyond the 14 days? And if you're a parent staying with your children and you're self-isolating for 14 days, can you actually get infected because the children keep passing it amongst themselves and then to you, even if you stay outside interactions with other people? I suppose theoretically. So we know that there's what we call pre-symptomatic transmission across the age spectrum. So that means 24 to 48 hours before someone starts to feel sick, for the first time, they can be shedding virus and can be infecting other people. Um, that's probably true of children as far as we know. There's no reason to think that's not the case and certainly true of the rest of us. That's why this is so difficult and why this preemptive social distancing is important because you can't just say, well, if I get sick, I'll stay home because for the last two days, you might have infected a whole bunch of other people. Um, so we know that's happening. There's no reason to think it's not happening in children. Because of the way they were approaching this, the reality is that once somebody in the household is infected, very likely that others in the household will get infected as well. It's just hard to stop that um, unless you happen to live in a big house where you can just, you know, put yourself off and stay in the garage or something like that, as, as some are trying to do. Um, so, you know, usually there's a 14 day period and we think after 14 days, you're probably not shedding virus and probably not contagious or it's not gonna be a very meaningful, uh, meaningful risk. I suppose that as you sort of, any of us who have kids know that, you know, the sort of stomach flu that they bring home from the nursery kind of works its way through the family and that takes days. That could take longer than 14 days. So, so yeah, that's a possibility. Reality is we're all shut in now and we're gonna be shut in for the foreseeable future. So even this notion of kind of self-isolating is just gonna become generalized for all of us, whether we're sick or not. Well, thank you very, very much for your time. Wildly helpful, very, very informative, a little bit scary, but I think all of us would rather have the facts to know how to respond both carefully, responsibly, and with compassion. And you've been a tremendous guy to that. So thank you. And we look forward to speaking to you again uh, in the days and weeks ahead. Let's make sure we put some good news in there tomorrow because there is some good news too. Thanks. Good. Thank you very much for joining everyone. Um, I know there's a ton of questions we didn't get to answer. So what we'll do is we'll put them front and center tomorrow and we will chat to Peter um, and then we'll kick off with other questions as well. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Paul. Um, and we'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Well, stay safe.